Well, hey, everybody. Thanks for coming back to the CEO for Life Experience podcast. Today, I have a guest that I've been working on for a while. We've had a little a little time in between booking and getting uh, getting um, Krista on, but uh, I want to introduce you to Miss Krista and to make sure that I pronounce the name, last name correctly, Molyan. It's Molyan, 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 but fine, it's fine. <laughs> okay, perfect. All right, that's awesome. It's, so, it's a French name, so in France, it's actually Molyan. <laughs> there you go. All right, well, hey, you know, if that works, then that works. That's great. Um, so I'm excited because here's why I'm excited, because obviously the CEO for Life Experience podcast is all about telling the story about people that are taking on the role that they've been born with, which is you are the CEO for your life in the workplace and life place. And Krista has an incredible story about not only being a, she's worked at the corporate side, but she's also been a long time entrepreneur running a large business in a very tech heavy, um, probably, you know, environment out in San Francisco. And then she's decided to make a change and be a solopreneur. So Krista, thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. That's awesome. So, um, so Krista, maybe we can start with just a little bit of context because um, talk a little bit about your journey and how you've reached here. Because again, um, like we were talking about just before we started, I really, really want to the, the podcast to be balanced, even from a lot of different areas, but specifically also from men and women's point of view. So maybe you can walk through a little bit of your experience as an entrepreneur and a solopreneur and how you've made decisions and kind of how you, you are where you are today. I'd love to talk about that. And I love your podcast name, uh, I think, and the book, uh, CEO for Life of Your Life, because I believe that not enough people realize that they are in charge. And that does, that sounds a little ironic, but it's true. It's really true. Um, so if you don't mind, I'll go back to the, the humble beginnings, because I do think it starts when you're a kid. If you pay attention, you're born with a lot of the skills that can help you succeed at being a CEO of your own life, but you may have them bogged down by expectations or rules or uh, discouragement along the way, especially in those early years when we're really open and a little bit vulnerable, um, we tend to tend to kind of underplay our our natural qualities and start going into who we're supposed to be versus who we really are. And I mentioned that because being the CEO of your life, I think when I was a kid, I had all the great qualities that I was just born with. Um, mm -hmm. I had imagination, I had vision, I had creativity, I had what I call sass. I'll talk about my sass in a minute. Um, and that's not the industry, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> that's me. That's me. The intelligence, right. I had drive, you know, motivation, very positive. I was always a positive person, a high energy, positive person, a people person. All of those skills I just talked about, I think I've had those since I was probably six years old. So what happened was along the way, I kind of had to mold myself into society's expectations. And so I went from dreaming of being a, a writer and maybe even a, a, a film director, you know, very creative profession into a corporate profession. And I think that's very typical of children's journey. You go from wanting to be an astronaut to, to, to becoming a, an accountant. I right? love that. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. That's a great narrative. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Uh, so that's why I said I wanted to go all the way back to childhood, because I do believe that we are born with certain qualities that are unique to you. But by the time we become teenagers, we've been told to be realistic, to focus on, on going to college and getting a good job. And, you know, that may not be really true. I think that a lot of what happens to us between our childhood and adulthood is, a, is just frankly a shame because a lot of our creativity is pushed down. When I was a kid, I was told to talk less and follow directions more. 
Stop asking questions. Just do as we want you to do. Just fill in the stupid test that's an ABC test. I'm like, why do we, why is it multiple choice? I want to write about it or, you know, no, it's multiple choice. That's the way it is. And then you're told, well, you need a sensible career. So the arts is not an option because those aren't money making careers. You don't want to end up a starving artist. So by the time you're 18, you're a whole different person. Uh, but that all those wonderful qualities are still inside of you. They're just, you've actually been taught to hide them. And sometimes I like to tell my clients now, I call it flip your flaws, which I didn't invent that. Someone even has a book called that. Um, mm -hmm. But when you're told, when I was a kid, they told me, stop your sass. You always sass people. And it turned out that sass has a double meaning. It's a negative term that means to maybe speak out of turn or speak in a little bit in, with insolence, but it also means being really self-confident and knowing what you want in life and being willing to, to go after it. And to succeed as the CEO of your life, that's a really great skill to have. So when people come, yeah. I say, what are your weaknesses? Because mm -hmm. a lot of times what you've been told are your weaknesses that you don't listen to authority, that you're a daydreamer, that you're slow, you know, those are actually really, really good qualities. Maybe you're very reflective, very imaginative, you know, so, uh, and even in school, look, we're told to focus more on our, our studies and, and mm -hmm. less on our friendships. I'm sure everyone heard that as a teen, like you're at school to learn, not to socialize, right? <laughs> But now as I've said adult, it as a parent. I'm sorry. I've said yes, it. of course. And you know what, though? But now as an adult, what's the most important thing to get you ahead in business and your career? Relationships. Relationships, networking, public speaking, yep. being able to communicate well. So how are you supposed to learn that if you're at school, but you're not supposed to socialize? That's where you learn all the dynamics. You learn how to be liked, how to be funny how to grab people's attention. How, so in a way, a teenage years are teaching you how to become an influencer. Mm. Wow. You know, you know so I just, this this. Is, I'm telling you, this is what I, <laughs> I knew by having Krista on was going to be good. I told every, I was telling myself and I was telling my wife and I was like, oh, this is going to be good this morning. I know it. So um, thank you. I, well, love, I, thought... I love everything that you've said, you know, because, you know, I think what we've heard a lot is, focus on your strengths, right? And, and, you know, and forget about your weaknesses, but, but those are your internal self-awareness weaknesses, right? But what the world is telling you is a weakness, what you're saying, which I love is what the world is telling you is a weakness. That may not be true, right? That's what, I mean, that's what that's I'm hearing. exactly right. In fact, I would like you to take all the things you were told as a kid with a finger wagging attached and re flip those flaws and think, hey, maybe I was the class clown. I got in trouble for being the class clown. What does that mean? It means I know how to build relationships. I know how to get attention. Um, I know how to be likable. You know, I have a great sense of humor. So all those things actually serve you later in life. Mm -hmm. And it Love really did minute. for me. Yeah. Um, so that's why I later in life, um, so fast forward, I definitely went through the corporate route because I was told that that's what I should do, go to college, go to a corporate job. And right. very early on, I realized that it was a lot like school, that I wanted to ask questions, but what, why are we doing this? This is pointless. Or why don't we do this another way? Or can I ask some more questions about what's behind this? What's the point of this? And I was told, just like in school, just do your job. We're not paying you for your ideas. We're paying you for your performance. Uh, we're not, you know, you're not the CEO yeah. here. So right. very early on, I realized that I was probably not going to be a good employee. Um, in mm. fact, most of the people who make the best entrepreneurs have been fired a few times in their lives or... Yeah you know, just were very bad employees because entrepreneurs have too many ideas and too much drive. And they're going like a hundred miles an hour. Whereas at work in a real corporate environment, you're going like 10 miles an hour, but you're going that for 
20 hours a day, which is boring and pointless. And there's a lot of red tape and a lot of bureaucracy and the processes are not optimized. They're not agile. Everything is just, well, that's the way we've done it. We're going to sit in these pointless conference calls for hours on end and write pointless emails to each other, then do pointless PowerPoint instead of just getting the work done and going home. You know, you know how in school, maybe you finished the test earlier and you were one of the first kids to finish the test because that was your top subject. And another kid had to stay in from recess because he still was struggling to finish the test. Why at work do we just make people sit eight hours? Why, why don't we say, here's what your goal is. Here are your objectives. You get them done, you can leave. Why are we still paying people by hour and not by true performance? It doesn't make any sense because just like at school, I might be a really good salesperson and I might close 20 deals in a day. And Bob, who sits next to me in the other cubicle, he can close 20 deals in a week. So then I'm a star salesperson, but why can't I get, why can't I just go home? I met my quota, you know? So it's really What's super interesting about, yeah. Yeah. What's super interesting (laughs) about what you're saying now and unpacking is, is, you know, this, this quote, this pandemic thing, right? It's forcing the virtual workplace, right? And so I think what you're talking about is we've been forced to really face this now is that there are people now that are working from home and they're getting everything done in four hours, whereas they had to sit in the office for eight hours, right? And so there's this awakening thing that's happening. At least that's that's my initial scratch at the surface. What are your, what's your take on that? 100%. And, and, Here's my take on it. My take is we need to rethink work in general. What is work? For me, work should always be goal-driven, performance-driven. All I want to know is that you get the job done that I'm expecting, and I'm going to be crystal clear of what my expectations are, and I'm going to be available for questions if you ever kind of get confused about those things. But beyond that, I don't care where you do your work, when you do your work, and how you do your work. Because just like in school, someone is going to do it quickly. Another person needs more time. And also, here's another thing that we haven't spoken about. In my business coaching practice now, I teach my clients how to master their energy. What that means is that you and I have different energy flows naturally. So do you know your energy cycles during a day? When are you optimized for your pre-performance of the day? All of us have peaks during the day. And these energy cycles are not taken account by the normal workplace at all. So we've got Bob over here who's a total night owl and really gets active at night and can do great work at night. We make him come in the office at 8.30 in the morning, 9 in the morning, after a one-hour commute. You can barely get a word out of Bob. So then by 1030, maybe Bob starts opening one eye. He's been there already an hour and a half, forcing himself down in coffee after coffee, struggling to wake up. And then we've got Susan, who by 6 a.m. in the morning, she's rearing to go. But by Great. two in the afternoon, Susan's dead. She's a fish. Yeah. Out. And then we don't structure our meetings according to our, our energy peak. So when right. I work with clients, the first question I ask is, to have them keep a time journal over a week and tell me what they're doing and when do they when do they work best and then we structure all their creative deep thinking development pro- production work for those hours and then when they're not at their optimal best we do all their administrative tasks like emailing scheduling billings um follow ups you know Stuff that doesn't require a lot of your brain power, you know. So, yeah, yeah, I, I, and that is so great because I want I want the listeners to to realize where this is coming from is is that you know Chris has owned a large business. I mean, she was in in you know in tech country in San Francisco, ran for twelve years a large ad tech VR three um, D agency. And, you know, so she, she, so where she's coming from is from a a deep level of experience. So how did you work through that process is being an entrepreneur and in owning that business? Were, were you in, were you in, were you employing a lot of the things that you're talking about or was there a lot of pushback? Um, so I think for me, 
there was a learning curve because when I first started my company, um, I didn't know any of this. It wasn't conscious. In fact, I think what's interesting. That's what is, I was hoping we were going to get to is there's just not a written book about this stuff. No, right there now. is no written book about it. And um, what I've realized is I had to go through a lot of trial and error. And I definitely at certain points in my career was a terrible manager, a terrible boss for my employees because I was learning as I was going along. And as I encountered a new situation, I was struggling with the way that I've been taught or the books that I've read about how things have to be versus what my heart is telling me. And now I'm totally in heart mode. So I've got enough self-confidence and I've got enough experience under my belt that as Mark Manson says, I don't give a F about these things. I don't need to read a a book and say, well, Elon Musk does that. So that must mean he's right because he's so successful. I don't follow other people. I can admire people and be curious about what they're doing. Of course. Just like on your podcast, your guests, you know, or your listeners are going to listen and they'll be like, hmm, that's interesting. But does that Mm -hmm. mean that you're going to run out and follow? you know, the 4 a.m. club, just because someone says that's the way you, should, you know, you want to be, maybe be a millionaire, you have to get up at 4 a.m. Right. Guys, listen, anyone listening should realize that you have to go through trial and error. But in the end, it all comes back to figuring out what your gut is telling you and being yep. very much in touch with your heart, your intuition, your integrity, and you'll be a better boss, you'll be more productive, and you'll be a lot happier. Yeah, I love that. I love the fact of, you know, the concept of reverse engineering you, right? I mean, that's that's what makes a good leader is you got to understand what's good with you. I mean, you know, we've already talked about, you know, flipping the flaws and those kind of things and in, in, in your strengths and, and, you know, trial and error, those kind of stuff, things. Talk a little bit about so reverse engineering you, right? Because you had the successful business. You were, you know, you know, obviously very well respected, lots of uh, accolades in the, in the industry. And so then you decide to make a change. So walk a little bit and reverse engineer us through that process. Yeah. So I spent all of my 20s building success, working really hard, um, being very courageous, going after the biggest clients in the industry uh, for my VR agency and one by one collecting trophies, you know, like being able to meet higher and higher income goals, uh, being able to have my dream office, being able to build my dream team, being able to work whenever I wanted to. Like Mm -hmm. in the middle of the workday, I was able to leave and go pick up my kids from school, spend a little bit of time with them and then go back online afterwards. No one was telling me, oh, you can't leave the office today. Being able to go work in the Bahamas, you know, for two weeks, just because, hey, why not, right? So in a way I had to buy a multi-million dollar home, um, work with top architects and designers on remodels and furnish it with my favorite designers from Italy and France. So I was just out there collecting all these external trophies in my 20s and Mm -hmm. what happened was in my early 30s I started having um anxiety and I remember the first time I had a panic attack I thought I was having a heart attack um so I broke out in a sweat anyone who's never had an anxiety attack it's really scary um I could not catch my breath, even though I hadn't been running. It felt like I had been on a a, a massive hike or a run. And I was trembling and I just sat down. My head was spinning. I couldn't even speak. And when I came to my senses, I drove to the ER. I don't even know how I got there, but I went in and, and I'm like, check me, do a full body scan. I think I had a heart attack. And I was so surprised and embarrassed when the doctor announced to me, your vitals look fine. You've had an anxiety attack. Right. Has this happened before? That was his question. He was all calm and everything. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You don't understand. I think I almost died. Like this was math. This was definitely. Something's really wrong. Right. Yeah. Your test must be wrong. Did you, are you sure you got the right, you know, so I didn't believe it. And from then on, 
I started um, just realizing at what point my my body was telling me you're burnt out. You can't go on yeah. like this. Um, and then the second phase was I started getting losing interest in yeah. competing, a losing interest in my work, losing interest in everything. In fact, nothing was making me happy. I went to amazing vacation in one of like the best resorts in in uh, in Mexico, and I'm sitting on the beach and I'm depressed. And oh. that's when I knew I have to change my life. So, from this massive success story came a burnout, mm -hmm. and then I it took me a few years to kind of unwind that. So I started like trying to do all these things. I started going to therapy. Um, I started meditating, you know, like always I was chasing the external, like, you know, how can I fix this? What should I do to fix this? Mm -hmm. And what I came to the realization was that it wasn't going to go away. And I needed to change my life. Like this period of my life mm -hmm. was great, but I needed to change. And it was very, very scary because in a way I felt like, well, this is the climax. Like I've worked my way up to this point in my life where I've got all these accolades, everything's lined up. What's wrong with me? Why am I not able to perform now? Why am I unhappy? Um, and so that's when I took a sabbatical and I said, how about some time off? Like, but not just these quickies, really a long time off. So I took six months off from my business and then I was supposed to come back. I walked in and I told them, I'm not coming back. I'm selling my shares. I'm leaving wow. the business. I want to cut ties with the business. And this was my baby. You have to understand right. 12 years, but it, but it wasn't just 12 years of being an employee somewhere. This is your, when it's your own business, it's like one of your children. Yep. It's really like blood, sweat, and tears. So it's I almost limb, felt like I was right? cutting it's, off my right? identity. Yeah. 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 So there was a lot of emotion going on. Um, but when I did it, you know, I felt really a, a huge relief. Mm -hmm. And what I gained back was much more valuable because then this is kind of like the, the second stage of my life, right? Second sure. chapter is I started gaining inner peace, inner peace yeah. that I'd never had in my whole life. My whole life was anxiety around right. trying right. to compete for a new client, trying to Control, do the best compete. job, yep. Yep. short deadlines, a lot of stress, a lot of putting out fires, raising a family, raising young children. So I was conditioned, my entire body and mind was conditioned to always be thinking about the next thing that I had to do. Uh, which was a massive amount of things in a 24 hour period, more than the average right. person. Uh, right. And suddenly it was all gone. And, and that was just like, okay, I can breathe again. I can, I can just enjoy life. I don't have to run after things. So that's why I became a solo printer. And I wrote a book about my experience. Um, in fact, I wanted to write a memoir and it turned into two memoirs because I divided the book into the first 18 years of my life because I had a really turbulent childhood that I haven't even told you about. Um, but I thought at first this was going to be one memoir, but then that turbulent childhood took over and it became its own book. Um, and then the second book starts when I'm 18 and goes up till I'm 38. So the next 20 years of my life, and that's where you find the whole, you know, building the career, climaxing, dropping down and starting over. You know, again, I, I, I just <laughs> want to continue this message and I, and I know I harp on it in the podcast, you know, what you're hearing mm -hmm. is, is a blending of the workplace and life place. And that's what, that's what being the CEO for your life really means is that the decision making that you use in the workplace is also applies to your life, right? You need to take responsibility. You need to take accountability. At the end of the day, I mean, Krista had to make a change. She knew that she took a step back. She analyzed it. She took the calculated risk. She, you know, she, she made the changes that she needed to in order to be the best version of herself because you, you don't realize, and I want everyone hearing this is 
you're impacting the world in ripples that you'll never know until some eternity from now. And so, you know, she knew she needed to continue to be the best version of herself. And I just love your story, Krista, so much. Because I've, I've gone through anxiety three times in my life as well, you know, clinically seeing someone gone through that process my first time 25, same thing I had to race out of the office I thought I was going to die, you know, I found the closest church I could I went in the back and just like, you know, crumbled I really thought it was done. And, um, and so you know, but, but again, understanding that you need to make changes associated with that, even if they're drastic changes, like cutting off a limb, like you did basically by, by, you know, by selling your shares. So talk a little bit about now your purpose. So, you know, we, you know, I just, I know we're running a little short on time, but talk a little bit about your purpose and what you'd like to impart on whoever's listening today. Um, You know, your purpose and then what you'd like to share with people. Yeah. So I think there's two types of people in the world. There's takers and there's givers. And it's normal that the first half of our life, we're more takers because we're learning. So we need the help. We, we're very dependent on our parents. For example, we're taking from them, right? Um, we're So then we go out in the workplace and we're trying to get more money, gain career, gain market value. So we're taking, taking, taking. And then your life transitions into being able to give back because you've got, you've, you know, you, you've been fortunate enough to get those things. And then you have acquired knowledge. You've acquired some kind of material ease where you don't have to hustle every day. And then it's time to give back to your community, give back to, you know, reach out your hand and pull the guy behind you up. Help the people who are next in line. You know, so that's what happened to me. And that's why I chose to be a solopreneur because I could have made a lot more money had I just Mm -hmm. become a CMO, Uh, you know, Mm -hmm. gone from running a digital agency, go back into the corporate world in tech um, and become a CMO. But for me, it was like same old, same old. I'm like, why would I leave my dream job to go work for someone else, even for a lot of money when? The whole reason I had this anxiety was because it was time to change. So my message to anyone listening is the more in touch you can be with your heart, the better. Because I think in my 20s, I was putting my heart way down there and I was focusing on these external metrics. And once you achieve those things, you may not be as happy as you think you'll be because maybe your needs have changed. You know, maybe when you're 21 and you're like, I need to buy a Lamborghini, that will make me happy. And then you're, you know, you're 40 and you've got a heart attack and the Lamborghini doesn't matter anymore. Your wife left you, you know? So my point is if you stay in touch with your heart and you look past the surface external material things, you're going to find deep inner purpose. You're really going to, and that could change over your lifetime when you're 20 and when you're 40, You're not going to want or need the same things. But one thing I can promise anyone listening, no matter what age you are, is the longer you're on this earth, the more you're going to understand what really matters. And it's a lot less than what you think. There's only a few things that really matter on this in this lifetime. And one of the most powerful exercises I did when I was going through kind of my should I stay or should I go journey? I was on my sabbatical is I went to a yoga retreat uh, because when you have anxiety, meditation, yoga helps. And the yoga leader did an exercise with us, which was to imagine that you're on the day of your, your, before your death. So you've just been given a death sentence. You know that you have 24 hours to live. And there's nothing that's going to change that. So over the next 24 hours, don't look for a cure. You're going to die. So now imagine what is giving you unrest. Why aren't you in peace? Like, why can you leave this earth? And why not? What have you not accomplished? And not only that, but what actually matters in those 24 hours? So are you going to go kiss your Lamborghini? (laughs) <laughs> are you, you know, are you going to go, are you going to go back in the office and try to crank out a few more spreadsheets? Right. So 
that really puts things in perspective. And, and that's one of, the, one of the series of things that helped me come to terms with it was time for me to move on because I think my ego didn't want me to let go. My ego is like, you're a C, you know, you've got this C-suite uh, lifestyle and you have power and influence. And, and in reality, it was time for me to go. It was just time to move on. So that's another thing with being the CEO of your life is we get too wrapped up in those external titles and metrics. And right. in the end, I feel better than I've ever felt before. Sure. You know, Absolutely. so in the end, that's what you should think about. What are you going to do with this one beautiful life you've been given? That's fantastic. So just to put a bow on it, because, you know, I, I we teed it up a little bit before we started recording. Um, and I, and I love that message. I mean, that just resonates for anybody, no matter who you are. Um, give us a little bit of a, a female or woman's perspective on maybe some of these decisions that you've gone through, because I do, I do want to bring that perspective to light because I do think it is important, even though we are the CEO for our life and workplace and life place, there still are differences between guys and girls. Right. So, um, I would love your perspective on, you know, being a woman entrepreneur and, you know, just maybe some, some high level, you know, what your thoughts are on that and, and maybe some things that people should think about that you can share. Well, first of all, I'm a feminist, which doesn't mean I hate guys. I love guys. Uh, but feminism means you're pro-woman. So you're thinking about women's interests. And I think that for a woman, we have a little bit of a different, um, different challenges than men, for sure. So I'm going to just speak from my own personal experience is when when a woman decides what she wants to do with her life, um, we have a strong people pleasing tendency because women for millions of years have been caregivers due to the nature of mothering, right? And when we say caregiving, it means not providing for other people, but taking care of them, which means I love to make other people happy. So when you think about being the CEO of your life, there's a conflict right there because other people might not be happy with the decision that you know in your heart is right for you or that you would like to pursue. And there's a very much stronger pull towards taking the decision that you know someone you love will make them happy or they'll approve of. You know, if you're daddy's girl, you wanna please your dad and study and do the career that you think he would most like for you. Um, then, then when you get married, you've got a husband and kids to take care of. And so there's a part of a woman that's deeply fulfilled from our very DNA in taking care of others. And I'm saying this as a feminist, right? I believe that that does fulfill. I do believe that men have a different type of DNA thing. And I don't think we should fight our nature. I don't think that I I'm proud to be a caregiver because I give, I get deep joy, deep joy from my very core in cooking a meal for you. You know, does that make me a weak woman or something? No. Or does it make me a weak? When I first had my first career in Silicon Valley, uh, I had a female boss who was in her late forties and had never married, never had children. And um, I happened to have, bit gotten married and was expecting my first child and I had to go in and tell her that I was expecting and I was so skinny that I'd been hiding it I was already like four months along wow. and no one had noticed because I was just really skinny and I went in there and sat down and said hey I want to tell you I'm expecting <clears throat> and you know she she with lukewarm sentiment, congratulated me. And then she proceeded to give me a pep talk where she explained that she herself had given up the possibility of marriage and child and, and child rearing to choose her career. And that's what got her up to the manager level. Wow. And she wanted me to know that if I was about to make this choice, I shouldn't expect any favors from her. So she said to me, I'm warning you, I'm not giving you any work from home privileges or extra time off. Uh, so if you're going to be a mother and you're going to continue here, you're going to have to work really hard. 
because you're not going to get any privileged treatment. So I'm just telling this story to everyone to, to put into perspective the conflict that we women experience when we're trying to be a CEO of our life. Not only the people pleasing, but also this push and pull between our natural desire to have a family right. and also have a thriving career. Can women have it both? That's my question. And I later on went to a male boss who was actually her boss in the same company in tech Silicon Valley. And he had pictures of his kids all in his office and his him and his mm -hmm. wife. They had celebrated their 30th wedding anniversary, something like that. And his wife was a homemaker. And he said, my wife gave up her career so that I could be here and have this beautiful office and this nice, and I provide for the family. And what we need to do is we need to have more women get into that office like that man was. And we need to have less women like my boss, my old boss, mm -hmm. pulling other women down. So what we need is we need more female CEOs at all levels, in all industries. Sure. And we need to be the, the primary way from a woman's perspective that, that we can be helped to be CEO of our lives is by giving us a lot of flexibility and a lot of support. And I don't need preferential treatment. Right. What I that need. I was going to say, right. There's a difference there, right. Is I need, I need you to meet me halfway. And I think yeah. women now with the COVID-19 working from home, there was an article recently in the New York Times talking about how hard it is for women to work from home because they're taking on the bulk of the, of the household and child rearing with the schools closed. So what can employers do or what can women themselves do? Advocate for yourself and help others. So really we, we should all be in this together, but how can you, you asked me about women's issues. If we're not talking about it and I'm just plugging away at my work and maybe my work performance is going down because I'm really struggling, but I'm not telling you, then how do you know how to help me? So unless we right. advocate for hey, I think it would be easier if we move the conference calls to the afternoons because in the mornings, my kids are running around. They're driving me crazy. I can't concentrate. We're ashamed. We're embarrassed. We try to hide our families. In fact, when I later on got my own business for a while, this is really shameful because I was like going through these power plays of being the strong woman executive. I didn't put my kid's picture in the office. Contrary to the men who would display proudly their kids, Mm -hmm. For me, it was a weakness, not a strength to mm -hmm. have kids. And for a while, a lot of my clients didn't know I had kids. Right. Because I never talked about my family. I never talked mm -hmm. about my private life. Whereas men go around talking about how proud right. they are. So do you see the problem here? Because for us, it's a weakness. It means I'm not as dedicated to my job. When a man has kids, it's the contrary. He's a good standing, you know, trustworthy guy when a woman has kids it's well she's either going to quit or she's going to you know do a half halfway job because she's not concentrated i love it i love it <laughs> you know and this is krista this is why i wanted to, to to bring you on and bring this up is you know so anyone listening to this you know if you want to connect with krista i'm going to link the information information on how to get in touch with her either up above or down below um, wherever you're you're listening or watching this, but um, you know, again, what I I just I'm doing this vlog and this podcast because I want people to meet as many people as they possibly can, hear their story, and then I want you to connect. Don't just let this vlog or this podcast just die at the end of it when we close this up, but connect with the people that that you're meeting because the people that I'm bringing on they really care, they really want to help. Just like Krista said, she wants to pull people with her. And, um, and I just, I'm, I'm so happy we did this time, Krista. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you for doing what you do. I think podcasting is an amazing way to get messages out there because we're having real conversations that you won't know about me. You wouldn't know any of the things we've discussed mm -hmm. by going to my LinkedIn profile or my website right. where you see my bio. These are private right. things that we're talking about and also things yep. from my character and my value system. Yep. And we, yep. we need to have more conversations to get to know people really. So 
I agree. I totally, I totally agree. And by the way, Chris is coming to us from Europe today. And, uh, and so <laughs> thank you for doing that. Listen, um, thank you guys for listening to the CEO for life experience podcast and also checking in with the vlog. Like I said, connect with Krista. Do not let this episode or any of the episodes that may connect with you or resonate with you. Do not just let them just end. And, and, uh, and if you listen to this at one and a half times speed, go back and listen at one because there's a lot of good stuff here to unpack. So thanks again, Krista, for the time. And we'll see you guys on the next episode of the CEO for Life Experience podcast.